Good afternoon everybody and welcome. Um, it's fantastic to see such a great turnout here of both West Australian and Australian grain industry representatives and associated businesses. Um, can I again express our gratitude, Constantine, for uh, coming all this way. Um, not only have you entertained West Australian growers and consultants in, in the Ukraine, but you've also ventured a long way from home to come down and meet your competition. So we're not sure if he's a wolf in sheep's clothing, which we'll talk about. <laughs> a little more. Can I just set the scene? So we have about 45 minutes. What we're going to do is uh, uh, we're going to ask a couple of questions of our panel and have a, an interactive discussion to begin with and then we'll throw it to the floor um, and there will be a couple of roving mics. Um, so I thought uh, just maybe to, to reiterate and set the scene a little bit before I ask my first question of maybe Jason. Um, Today we see that Ukraine and Russia, the Black Sea, is the largest wheat exporter in the world. 30 years ago it was one of the largest importers of wheat in the world. There's been a massive transition. If you look at the current situation, the numbers that Constantine put up there, um, if you look at the most recent uh, changes in the marketplace, of course the Australian outlook on production is quite pessimistic and we've got a crop that's going from say 35 million tonnes last year in wheat back down to somewhere in the, in the vicinity of 20, 21 million tonnes. That means that our exportable surplus this year will be somewhere in the order of the low teens, 15, 16. Uh, it means today that West Australian and Australian wheat is probably 35 to 40 US dollars higher and more expensive on a landed basis than black sea wheat. In addition to that, for the last three or four months, we've seen a situation where that price differential has probably been as high as $60 a tonne. So what that meant is that, in fact, the Black Sea has taken a larger market share, I would argue, over the last three or four months in particular, and, and a major focus of consumers. Um, I guess the one other restriction that, that Constantine mentioned was logistics, um, the rail car restriction. There is a common theme amongst marketers and traders around the world that's understood that, that 30 million tonnes of exports is probably a restricted number in terms of both Russia, Ukraine, Black Sea sort of exports. And it's going to be an interesting topic to see if that number is actually exceeded or challenged or... And so what you're seeing now is an adjustment in price. Um, and there's lots of changes that are now going to affect the immediate outlook and competition. So Jay, first question for you. We have this, uh, this young energetic entrepreneur. Is he taking your market share? Is he cutting your lunch? And are you concerned? That's a good question. I think as we see in 1617, uh, and if you look at the figures that Constantine had up, four of Ukrainians' top 10 markets were in Asia. And one of their biggest markets was Indonesia. And so we have seen in the last couple of years where the Ukraine and, and Russia are taking some of our market share. But this is on a growth platform, if you remember. And, you know, particularly places like Indonesia, Vietnam and the Philippines, they're growing anywhere between 3 and 5%. So, yes, they are taking some of our market share, but it's in a growth market. It's how do we use that growth as an opportunity to increase our productivity here in Western Australia and of course in Australia. So Constantine, you, you've illustrated that you know production outlook um, is quite strong. You know the next uh, forecast for, the, for, for production increases is still sort of 50% increase in production. Um, from an Australian perspective I think we're, we're currently sort of looking at productivity increases in the order of one to two percent. So I mean is that something that you're worried about as well or we should be worried about that, that we're only going to lose market share. Ultimately, are we accepting our fates that, that we're going to lose market share? What can we do about it? And what are we going to be doing about it? Yeah, I think the market share, I did a quick little figure. Um, you know, last year we were, say, 35 million tonnes. Uh, Constantine's talking about another 50% increase in wheat production in the Ukraine alone. Um, 35 million tonnes, we would have to be close to 50 million tonnes in 10 years. And if you think of that from a West Australian perspective, our biggest wheat crop was last year around 10 million tonnes. If we increase that by another 5 million tonnes, that's quite a big increase over 10 years. So, um, yes, 
we're under pressure here, but it's about investing not only in the supply chain, but in the productivity. And it's a whole industry uh, investment. It can't be just farmers investing. It can't be the supply chain investing. We're going to need a large investment across the industry. Constantine, talking about one of the major issues in marketplaces that's the unknown, the black swan event, and politics plays a major part in that. And of course, one of the questions I think that we always have in the back of our mind is sovereign risk. Can you give us some background and some information about the commercial realities of the relationship between Russia and the Ukraine, ultimately in the political sense, and how, how is that impacting the business? Yes, uh, I was expecting such a question. It's really a very, <laughs> a very important one. But uh, uh, first of all, we got really difficult situation, the hot war with Russia. But the hot uh, operation finished in February 15. So we got already for two and a half years the stable situation. And also you should understand that the conflict been on very small part of Ukraine. It's a half, Ukraine got uh, altogether 20, 28 regions, and we got conflict only 50% uh, of two regions, uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. And especially those regions are uh, important in uh, heavy industry, like a steel production, uh, coal mining, but in the grain uh, business, in the agricultural itself it's not very important region so it's quite quite small and very industrial regions so for us even you know in the middle of the revolution in ukraine in the middle of war in russia okay we've been worrying and they you know checking every five minutes uh, internet and tv but you know the grain production and grain export never suffered uh, any single day we got some small problem the port uh, Port of Mariupol, uh, which is a small port for coasters, uh, the rail railway has been uh, uh, partially uh, broken, and it's still not working in the full capacity. But you know, it's very small port, so it's exporting maybe half a million tons, you know, in, in best case. And uh, even you know, there is a Kofco plant in Mariupol, and this plant being stopped maybe for. You know, a couple of times or a couple of days, but was you know still working. Uh, even you know some fights been just you know 15 kilometers from the factory. <laughs> so and for the moment, you know, the relation is you know still uh, still bad. But you know relations between uh, between the governments, you know relation between you know countries and the personals, you know quite good. You know where. Uh, we used to live, you know, in more or less in the same culture, you know, still, you know, big part of Ukraine is speaking uh, Russian language. And it should finish, you know, the, you know, the good presidents, uh, governments, you know, they can be for the long period of time, they can be, you know, very uh, autocratic, you know, like, you know, Russian president, but, you know, it's sooner or later it will finish, the situation should be normal. But at the same time, you know, Ukraine going uh, closer, closer to integration to the Europe, uh, in June 17, the uh, European Union uh, stopped the issuance of visa for Ukrainian citizens so you can go without any problems now to, to all the countries of Schengen Zone, which is basically all the European countries except the uh, UK. So yeah, it's going this, uh, this direction. We're not expecting uh, any uh, short integration, European Union, you know, they got so many own problems and even getting more now <laughs> with uh, Spain, Catalonia, and they still uh, cannot swallow all the problem integration of East European countries, you know, like Romania, Bulgaria, which, you know, more or less, you know, the same level of, uh, uh, let's say, of um, development as, as Ukraine, the only difference Ukraine Ukraine is much bigger in the population, much bigger in the area and it's been always considered too close to Russia. So <laughs> otherwise, you know, it's more, more or less the same. So situation is normal. Uh, economy is slowly, slowly improving. The agricultural sector become the number one in terms of uh, uh, share in GDP in terms of share in the export. It used to be five, seven years uh, 
the third business after steel export, uh, after fertilizer industry, definitely. Today, agriculture is number one and developing further. Mm, very interesting. Kane, maybe to switch across to you, two questions, I think. One, uh, Mitsui has investments in South America, in Russia, in Australia, in the US, Canada. Is there a particular experience that you'd want to share with the audience around your investment experiences in South America or, or Russia versus places like Australia or the US? Yeah, uh, there's some that I cannot really <laughs> talk about, but uh, yes, uh, some that I can talk about is, of course, the US, Australia, those uh, investment, including your company, is being successful. Uh, I think that was mainly driven by stable country politics, <laughs> economics, rather than stable, rather stable forex, and maybe transparency of the logistics. So those two, I mean three, four key points are the one of the, the important point that uh, when we talk about investment in those countries. In other countries that I, I didn't mention, those are the the difficult ones that are, you know, it's, it's kind of remote for some companies in, like us in Japan, that you know, you, you wouldn't really want to go in there a bit by yourself. You've got to have someone that who can guide us, which means local partners. That, that's my experience. Yeah. Okay. Second question is more about uh, market access. Japan, as, as was mentioned, is uh, seen as a long-term sort of stable market from an Australian and in particular West Australian perspective. Um, I, I guess, uh, have you seen Black Sea enter the market in, in a way? There's been a small amount of Black Sea product, Ukrainian and Russian product entering yeah. the market, but, uh, but have you got any perception on that? And what's likely to be the near-term outlook in terms of access? Like Konstantin's presentation, he was saying that, you know, for Japan and Korea, it's not that easy for black sea e grain into the market or compete against the Aussie wheat. Uh, one of the strengths for the wheat is, you know, all those effort by those aged people, other industry people that are working in last 30 years for like a, creating the noodle wheat for our udo noodle. And that was one of the things that, you know, it's kind of quality side of aspect that, you know, probably Black Sea origination cannot replace so easily. That's one thing. And uh, Japanese food wheat import system is still under control by the government, some part. And we mainly import US, Canada, Australia. And so it's under government control. And uh, if that opens up to the free trade system, then flowering companies who prefers to buy Black Sea wheat, they can they can go for it. So that, that's one of the risks for existing origination countries like Australia. Okay. Jay, maybe just to, to reiterate the fact that, that CBH Group has opened an office in Russia, is, is obviously interested in, in supplying uh, or opportunities to supply. Let's talk about both the risk and the objectives behind that. I mean, you, you could argue one, the obvious question is, are you cutting your own lunch? Um, uh, and the second issue is, what about the risks associated with being a participant in that market at a, at a FOB level or, or inland? Yeah, so we, we have a small office in Krasnodar with uh, four people there. Um, and it's really because it's the biggest market in the world from a, in terms of an export market. Uh, we really need to understand what is happening there. And whilst we're only accumulating off some of the agro holdings, clearly there are risks. And whenever you're investing in other countries, you have to manage those risks. And two clear ones are obviously country risk. Uh, with uh, having a small office in Russia, of course, there is some country risk. And currency is an important part. Uh, the, the Russian ruble has been extremely volatile compared to the Australian dollar, and so you have to be quite cautious in that respect. Most of the time it's been going in our favour, but of course it can go against you as well. OK, great. Paul, you've been sitting quietly there. We now need to turn our attention. If you, if you, some of the messages around the investment uh, attractiveness of, of the Ukraine market. Um, Konstantin is a listed entity. Um, in discussions with him over dinner last night, I think we were both surprised that he is not 
been in the need to raise capital. He's making enough money to be able to fund his business. Um, what's your perception about the investment uh, attitude in Australia towards the agri-industry? What's changed? What's your major trends? And are we likely to attract investment in terms of some of the efficiencies that Jay's been talking about um, in, in matching competition? going the right direction. But essentially in Australia, on the listed sense, we've had now, I suppose, a critical mass of companies that have come in. Um, essentially the, uh, the grain industry kicked it off by having uh, three companies listed around 98 through to 2002. And since then we've had the growth in the, the dairy sector. Uh, Elders has finally started to try and make some money, so that's, uh, that's not a bad way to, to go. And, uh, and we've had a number of other smaller companies come up, like Ridley, that's been a sort of a overnight success after 20 years or so. So we, we do now have this critical mass. So what that means is the 10 or so investment managers that sit around AMP, BT, Petrol, have to have a view on agriculture because we have a critical mass of companies there. So there is an appetite for it. Uh, the trend is really down to volatility. A lot of what we're talking about today I think will be volatility and hopefully by having this critical mass of companies that are a little bit more vertically integrated as Constantine's talking about, we can have these steady companies that people can sort of sit in like the, the BHPs, the Rios of the, the ag space and then you can step out from there and invest in a few other sort of either high growth companies or other opportunities. So that, that, that growth critical mass has occurred we now are trying to get into this game of, of getting rid of some of the volatility and the big success stories, if you look at the trends in the last three years, it's been Bega Cheese, which is now the largest dairy company, having been the smallest dairy company back in 2000. And the other success story is the Costa Group, which has made a mockery of uh, dealing with the supermarkets. They've actually started to make some money dealing with the supermarkets and they're now one of the doyens in the horticulture space. Okay. The other question, I guess, was about integration um, or, or comment around integration. I, are you seeing, you have an office in Hong Kong, you're off to Hong Kong tomorrow. Are you, what's the attitude for the investment group in Asia in terms of looking at integration, looking at those opportunities? Is there any particular observations? Oh, look, I, I think people are, are interested in it. The, the, the thing about Asia is Australia seems to want others to do, this is my, my perception, they, they want others to do it first and then they might have a look at it. So if you look on the ASX now, there's actually around 20 to 25 listed Chinese companies that are listed here on the ASX. Uh, you wouldn't really know that much about it because I don't think the press is really that interested in, the, in that, uh, that, that dynamic. Uh, the other problem is a lot of them have listed here and they haven't really been a success story just yet. Uh, one of the groups we're going up to see tomorrow, as Andrew pointed out, is the largest citrus grower in China. And would you believe that's actually listed here in Australia? It's called Dongfang Modern. So that's, that's a $350, $400 million market cap company. It's the largest orange citrus sort of trader, and they also are vertically integrated. So there's interest from China coming back down here. They like the systems down here. They like, the, I suppose, the Tier 1 rating that we get, which is something that uh, we've all been talking about, that, that service, that tier one sort of value add. So they're coming down here, the, going back the other way, we're a little bit reticent to go there. In fact, CBH with their long term view is one of the few Asian, um, or a few Australian ag companies that's actually put a substantial amount of money off there. And, you know, say West Farmers, which has always said that they're going to grow, they've sort of been all growing in Australia, they've only just got into, into the UK, so CBH is taking the lead there. Mm. Okay. All right, just before I throw it to the floor, um, Constantine, one of the issues, uh, and you drew it out in your presentation, is, is around quality. Um, I, I think there's been a perception in the past that the Black Sea quality has been uh, lesser than Australia. Our quality advantage is quite clear. Um, what's your perception on the change in, in your quality over a period of the last 10 years or so? And I'm going to ask Jay again that question in, in terms of a perception of quality change. So is, is overall the quality of the Black Sea product improving? Yes, quality is uh, 
really improving and uh, we see both in Ukraine and Russia we still got uh, quite especially in Ukraine quite a big amount of feed wheat but uh, feed wheat due to the reason that some farmers uh, haven't got enough uh, finance uh, to you know to do the best uh, technology and their decision is uh, to apply as you know small inputs as possible and they're producing the feed wheat and still getting some margins but what we see that uh, big holdings including us uh, we can produce a really good quality and uh, our advantage we still cannot compete uh, on uh, markets uh, like high protein it's not really our market but what's really our market it's 11 and a half protein 12 and a half protein and we can do really stable good quality so this quality is uh, much better than uh, some traditional exporters like France, for example, or we've been discussing uh, many times with different uh, millers from different parts of the world, and they're saying that basically Russian, Ukrainian 12 and a half wheat is basically the same wheat as American hard red winter, just uh, uh, much better priced. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, when you uh, also we got you know beside, we always got relatively uh, good uh, protein the gluten but sometimes uh, Ukrainian Russian wheat was uh, less successful in additional <coughs> parameters important for millers uh, like uh, back damage uh, the W etc but it looks like the technology is really growing and uh, both Russian Ukrainian farmers now fully realize how to protect the plants and this problem is uh, almost completely over. It's, it's interesting in Australia we have a, a range of segregations uh, quite complicated segregations and quality segregations is it the same in the Ukraine or is it a, 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 a f in terms of being efficient and handling other grains is there some restrictions on the amount of of segregations that you would have? Or yeah, we got quality? basically uh, six classes. In reality, three because uh, class one is hardly exist. It's something like a very, very high quality mm -hmm. wheat. And we got class two, which is about 12 and a half, class three, which is about 11 and a half, and class six, which is a feed wheat. We got uh, a separate uh, uh, classified class four, class five. It's kind of uh, feed wheat with uh, higher protein content but it's usually sold for some particular markets like Bangladesh mm -hmm. maybe a few others so our system it's not that uh, not that complicated mm -hmm. still you can get uh, you know different quality uh, because what our company is producing our class 2 is not really 12 and a half it's rather 13 or more it's our 11 and a half it's also it's rather 12.2, uh, 12.3, but you know within the range, uh, still it can be no different quality, and some customers asking for some particular quality, and we can supply that. Mm. Okay, very good, Jay. In your experience as as a as a miller, um, what's been your perception of the change in quality over a period of time from Black Sea product? Yeah, I think you know previously Black Sea product was. Uh, quite ordinary. Um, you only used it if you really needed it and you'd use it as a filler wheat. Uh, today when we're selling into Southeast Asia in particular uh, we're really competing against the Black Sea and our customers before when they used to complain about prices and they'd compare against the Black Sea they would eventually we would politely wait and wait and eventually they would buy off us. Today we are politely waiting but we're 40 US above and they're buying off the Ukraine and the Black Sea. And so this is the difference. They are now starting to use these products a lot more. They've got the capabilities to handle it. They've got the capabilities to mill it. And so we are seeing a big difference from probably five and even seven years ago, and we're seeing some of the quality consistency. But I'd like to make the note that Australia's quality is still well regarded. It's just that that gap is getting shorter and shorter. Yep, okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, can I just point out there's two roving microphones um, and, and uh, Alan have got. Um, can I just ask that if you have a question, put your hand up and please introduce yourself to our panel, any one of our panel. Anybody with a question?
my gosh. Uh, thank you, Ian Blaney, Shadow Minister for Agriculture. Constantine, um, give us a year. When do you reckon you're going to beat us on quality? <laughs> when do you think you will have better quality than Australia? What year? How many years away? I, I do not think that uh, they need better quality than, than Australia. I, I just mentioned uh, Ukrainian wheat, the advantage is stable quality, let's say, of the middle segment. It's really difficult to compete against Canada or Australia, the countries, or Kazakhstan, you know, with different climate and with different, uh, different uh, quality. So it's not, uh, it's not uh, our strategy to substitute all origins in the world. It will never happen and we do not need that. We would like to concentrate on the particular segments. We are strong, as I mentioned, sun oil, sun meal, corn will be further growing and milling wheat of normal good quality but not super high pro. 11 and a half, 12 and a half, maybe 13, but I'm not expecting uh, high quality. We do not need that. It will be rather a problem of uh, yield uh, productivity. It doesn't mean it's impossible. Everything is possible, but probably no need. It's also you know, a question of, of reputation on the world market. We know that how conservatives are millers in different countries. That uh, for the moment, it doesn't make sense for the, let's say, in close perspective, 10, 15 years. After that, we shall see. Constantine, just to add to that, are your farms focused on productivity or increase in quality? Uh, we are trying to do both. We are trying to do both. Uh, yeah, Colin Nickel uh, from Grain Growers. Um, Constantine, thanks very much for a very informative uh, address. Um, the question I have for you though is, uh, do you see climate change or climate variability having any impact on your production? Uh, yes, we got uh, climate impact uh, and we got positive and, uh, and negative uh, results and that. So, as I mentioned, we got uh, western and northern part of Ukraine, the region has been considered as a marginal areas and now it's the best areas for production, uh, high yield crop like corn. We can, uh, we can do in these regions now corn up to last season up to 10, 11 tons uh, per hectare with average in Ukraine, especially in the south, it, you know, four or five hectares, uh, four or five tons per hectare. So it's definitely getting more and more difficult in the southern part. Southern part becoming uh, drier and drier and the risk of drought is high every year and the yield is definitely suffering and corn cannot be produced in the south, in the east so we got uh, positive and negative, more positive for the moment, but we'll see, we'll see how it will further happen. Thank you. Ian, sorry, over there. Thanks very much. Um, Norm Trithui from SRG Corporate. Um, my question is for Paul, um, but first of all, thank you all of you for a, an excellent panel session. Um, Paul, you talked about the volatility uh, preventing corporate investment in agribusiness, if I understood you correctly. Um, and I read with interest the recent announcement by Host Plus as a super fund that are making a big foray into, into uh, agribusiness, or planning to anyway. Um, my question was uh, around the, the reason for that volatility. I believe it's, it's mostly about weather risk management, and the, in Australia anyway, because uh, rainfall is often a, a determinant of uh, how, how many millions of tonnes we produce. Do you think that corporate investors in agribusiness will be more likely to hedge that weather exposure the way that energy companies have done for, for 20 years now? Um, because growers don't seem to be taking up things like multi parallel uh, crop insurance or weather derivatives at, at nearly the sort of rate that, that, um, that might be dictated by that volatility. Thanks. Okay, uh, I think, I mean, I'll try and answer part of it and then you can go in the right direction again, but 
I think we've got a, I suppose, a scale issue here where investors are, are, are happy to invest in, in those larger companies that are more diversified and larger companies are able to take up a lot of those tools, as are the larger farmers here, they can take up those tools. So there is that, um, that, that interest from investors to, to, go, to push these larger companies to either uh, get less of volatility with the vertical integration that Constantine was talking about and for, for uh, I suppose, products. Uh, I think I always hark back to the American system there where they've got this wonderful insurance system which we look at with in awe but they're sort of 13, 14 times bigger than us so, you know, and they've got you know, Donald Trump, you know, America first sort of thing sort of pervaded in, in that so you know, if, if we could all band together and perhaps if, if the, the West Australian groups could band together a bit and reduce some of that volatility the, the, the multiplier effect would be phenomenal if you, if you could get rid of some of that volatility the, I think for every dollar you invest in that, you'd get 10 plus back. I mean, maybe Jay can talk about it, but from an investment point of view, take away some of the volatility, the, the appetite to get into those spaces with less of volatility, and Costa Group's the, the one I mentioned before. Costa Group is an is a aggregation of companies that were trading at very low multiples, eight times PE. So this is back in the sort of the, the days that they were trying to all sort of negotiate separately with supermarkets. You bring them all together, Costa Group's gone from eight times to sort of 25 to 30 times PE. And what that means is that they can then go and buy assets, they can buy avocado farms and things and bring it in and that, it becomes a python. And what perhaps, you know, grain growers, large grain growers become pythons, where we've seen them, that happen. I think in, in the corporate field, investors would love a couple of pythons to grow in, in the sector. So Jake, could you talk about whether you could band together and get rid of some of the problems? <laughs> uh, look, I think volatility is there. It's always in the grain business. Um, I think, you know, you tend to see volatility in the supply side rather than in the demand side. Uh, demand con continues to basically grow with population normally and we get the big 20 or 30 percent swings in the supply sector. So, um, you know, when we're talking about investing, I guess, in the supply sector, which most of us are in, um, I, I think that does concern a lot of investors because that is the sector that does swing. It's interesting to see though in Russia and the Ukraine and Argentina where the, I guess the yields are improving, there's a lot of productivity increase, people are prepared to take on that risk in a greater, greater amount or a greater volume than what they're probably doing in Australia. You know, if we looked at grain production, take away the cattle, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Sadiq. Hi. Uh, Karen Bort Sadiq from the University of Western Australia. Thank you for the uh, interesting um, story about the growth uh, in grains industry uh, in Ukraine and other countries, Constantin. I just want to know who is supporting the research and development. There must be a story behind the, the rapid growth, the improved varieties, the production technology, and translation of that uh, outcome to the farmers. So is the government or the industry, how can you just briefly tell us? Uh, unfortunately, we do not have any uh, support from the government at all. All the research and developments uh, done by ourselves. We got a special department, the part in the department within the farming department, doing a lot of research and development in, in productivity. We got uh, many different uh, experiments. We are trying. Um, to produce, you know, to, to use different type of seeds. Uh, we are trying to produce in different regions. We got a special program for testing the soil productivity in order to control the amount of fertilizers uh, to, be, to be used. We are, for the moment, we started to use uh, a lot the quadracopters and also this uh, uh, how to say it, pilotless planes. So we are all using for, you know, to, to understand the develop of the crop, how it's going on. It was not possible before. The agronomist, you know, can take, you know, some samples from the corner. Now we are doing, we are subscribed for many different weather programs, for, you know, from different satellite company from US. So we're really investing a lot of money in research and development. Great. 
at the back. Chris Walker from Grain Growers. I think in your talk, Constantine, you mentioned that you had a small problem uh, with the Indonesian ports and you solved that in virtually a season. Uh, and I just wondered whether that was because you had a great trade office and uh, government support in that area in uh, improving protocols, etc., or whether you would elaborate on how you solved those types of issues. Uh, yes, it was really a problem, but uh, more more for Russia than for Ukraine. Uh, Indonesia started uh, like additional uh, test program, and they make accreditation of few laboratories. Uh, and uh, Ukrainian uh, exporters they passed uh, all this uh, test quite fast. Russia been a bit different, uh, you know. Since uh, the government role is is quite important, and the position, as my understanding was, uh, someone is not really like our wheat. Okay, no problem. We are not going to issue any certificates, <laughs> and we will not export those uh, direction as well. But hopefully, also uh, the sense uh, was you know uh, was winning, and now Russia resuming the export uh, to Indonesia with all. Indonesian requirements passed, so should be no problem anymore. Crawford. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Crawford Taylor from Rabobank. Um, a question for Constantine. I think in your um, your presentation, you, you mentioned that the production increase in the Ukraine may be conservative. So my question is, if with effective land reform and going on from the question from Sadiq about adoption of technologies, do you actually have a view on how far production could increase uh, above your forecast of 102 million tonnes, if everything came together? Uh, yes, uh, we, when we calculated, uh, we discussed that it's a conservative view. It definitely can be uh, can be better, but it's very difficult, you know, to say exact numbers. I think, you know, another uh, 10 millions with, you know, good weather, it's uh, it shouldn't be a, shouldn't be a big issue. But uh, we are trying to calculate the sustainable growth, and sustainable should be above 100, which is a really huge number and a huge step even from uh, current position. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions. Will. Thanks, Young. Um, Constantine, look, probably my question relates uh, to something we've seen in WA where we've seen a, a lot of the increased grain production has been at the sacrifice of the livestock production. So in, with the Ukraine, is it simply that the expanding area and the tonnage has been at the expense of livestock? Uh, no, not really. We don't have big increase uh, in uh, in arable land. So the arable land is uh, is stable with very very little growth. So all the increase is due to productivity. Pat, lucky last. Uh, Pat Ashenasi, Grain Trade Australia. I was getting a bit confused there before listening to Jay and 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 yourself, Andrew, about um, market share and saying you know market share we're losing market share and and. Part of the, the assumption, I guess, that I can you, you worry about is that it, as a performance indicator, that tends to drive behaviour and what people do, and we we see that in the headlines in the banking sector, with apologies to the bankers, um, quite often. So I guess the question, you know, we're a $40 premium to black sea wheat, we're worried about our market share, what should our real performance indicator be? Yeah, it's a good question. You, you're pointing at me. <laughs> well, ultimately, ultimately, that we have a sustainable industry that, and, and we're able to maintain, I guess, the opportunity to sell the production that we've got, and whatever that might be in terms of expanding that production. I think if you look at it uh, for this coming year, for example, you, you might give yourself a tick in the sense that if you were able to maintain a $40 premium and sell all our exportable surplus, then theoretically you've achieved an outcome that's positive. Um, I, I think the, the danger is that we're accepting that, that we can't meet the growth expectation um, and that ultimately we're going to concede a certain amount of ground. It's just whether we're proactive enough 
in terms of achieving the premium, ultimately the premium in my opinion. Yeah, and I think, you know, probably a little bit slightly different, we're in a bulk export business and that's the business that we're in and we need to see productivity throughout the supply chain, we need to see productivity on farm to ensure that we're competitive and we can maximise the value not only to, to the industry in terms of price but also the margin. And the margin is the most important part in this whole business. And if, but if our cost base is increasing quickly and our productivity is not uh, is declining or not increasing at the same time of our costs, of course our margins over time as an industry, from right from the grower all the way to the end of the supply chain, will decline over time. I, I think one of the observations I also would add was that the, the decline in, in, uh, in fobbing costs or shipping costs was something in Australia that's a unique experience. We haven't experienced that yet. I'm looking forward to a decline in costs <laughs> um, that we can obviously pass on to growers. Well, well, as, a, <laughs> as a promotion, CBH's costs were down this year after of course, rebates. <laughs> let's not get into that debate. Let's not get into that. Paul, would you like to add? I mean, if you're looking, well, one of the other key takeaways from Constantine's presentation was the, the push into sunflowers and sunflower seed and the push of uh, Canada into canola. So what, what is the niche product that perhaps West Australia can get into to grow the margin? That, that's the key question I would have thought that followed on from the previous. So what, what is it, Jay? Right. What, what these guys? Yeah, I think it's a combination of both. I think profitability and margin is the most important. And growers in, in Western Australia and in, in Australia change quickly to take on um, improved margin. We've seen growth in canola you know, over a number of years. We've seen actually growth in barley over the probably last four or five years. And wheat as a percentage of the crop has actually come down. So you know, farmers in Australia do change quickly depending on where they see the gross margins or they forecast them. Um, I think canola has been a, a really good one for us over the last probably seven or eight years. Uh, barley, certainly malt barley and, and feed as well. So uh, yes, we have been changing. Processing side, so Constantine's into processing, putting more crushes in, so why doesn't CDH do that sort of thing? I think we're... <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect question, but you know, we've invested in Interflower, we've done that at the, at the destination. The question is whether you do it at the origin. Uh, there's been a lot of work done on trying to do this at the origin. Clearly we don't have a big domestic market here in Western Australia. We see some of that in Eastern Australia, but I'd suggest flour milling in Australia hasn't been very profitable uh, for quite a few years, and I don't think you know, the board of CBH would want to invest in uh, flour mills in Australia where the margin is probably less, or the gross profit margin is probably less. Okay, so now we, we finished off with a little bit of controversy up on, on the table up here, but I, I, our host is, uh, is looking at us. Can I just uh, ask the audience to again extend our uh, thanks and appreciation in particular for our, our guests up here, in particular Constantine who's come so far, so thank you very much. Jim.